Hey YouTube, it's Dimitri, and today we're gonna to talk about building quantitative careers here. So this is gonna be focused around quant finance. Uh, this will also apply though to any other quant careers if you wanna deviate, so we'll say, you know, machine learning, data science, and all that as well. Uh, but we're just gonna dive on in here and talk a little bit about building these careers and some of the fallacies that we see around this and some of the mistakes that a lot of you are making. Uh, both at the beginning of a career and in the middle and towards the end here. So the first point I want to make is that careers are not linear. So we like to have this idea in our head. I know it's stuck in my head. It's burned in there from graduate school. It's burned in there from a finance degree in corporate America, right? We have this hierarchy here that we like to view. And, you know, it's the analyst associate, AVP, VP, SVP, director, MD, CRO, and CEO at least for the quant rundown here, right? This is the runway that we see. Um, and again, it's gonna vary firm to firm here, but we like to think that's this nice linear process, right? And everybody knows, you know, for an analyst, you've got like a two year stint, basically a two year career. And then as an associate, you work another two years and then you become an AVP and then you typically work that between, I don't know, two and three years. And then at VP, you're looking at maybe, I don't know, three to five depending how you perform. If you're amazing, you're still you know, on that two-year schedule. And then we have SVP and director, and now you're waiting longer and longer and longer. And basically the goal here is to climb this, I don't know, this hierarchy here. Realistically, this organization chart that we see, and obviously the higher you go, the more money you make. And so clearly this is the only thing in life that matters and we've oversimplified it. Um, this is 100% incorrect on the way to look at careers and quant development specifically. Um, one of the key points here is that you're gonna be seeing there's multiple firms. So depending if you're at a global firm, a national firm, a regional firm, a local kind of a bank or hedge fund or investing firm here or cryptocurrency, um, you need to start realizing there's like these nets of hierarchy. And so we don't stay at one job, one company, our whole careers, uh, people move and bounce around. And so part of that, of why this is such a terrible way to think about things is this isn't how the industry as a whole is structured, right? A firm might be organized like this, but this is not how firms are structured. And again, it's not as linear as we like to think. And so the reality here, what a career looks like and the way I like to look at it, right? It's messy, it's unpredictable, and it's very chaotic. Um, if you're starting off probably at the beginning of your career or you've been at one firm for a long, long time, sometimes it's hard to see this. But the way I like to view this from a large perspective on a career is kind of like free falling through a Mandelbrot set here. So you can see on the screen, right, this is the Mandelbrot set. And of course, this is a short little GIF I've created. Um, but we start and you see the traditional imaging here and of course black is stable and different colors along this gradient is different sorts of stability you can view this kind of as a career right if you go towards the black portions of this we can fall through an infinite black loop where you're stuck in this very very stable environment um, the free falling effect of through the mandelbrot is the way to look at it uh, is more or less like time as we're going through this there's no stopping time right everybody else is building careers all these corporations are moving Technologies are being built. Um, you can't just pretend like you're gonna stop for a second and figure things out. Uh, everything is constantly moving here. And specifically, right, don't be afraid to change and grow who you are as a person. So as you're kind of going through this, right, you're seeing the colors, you're trying to figure out how much stability you want, how much chaos you want. Um, again, right, chaos is gonna bring excitement and fun new things. Often it brings more money, uh, it brings more excitement. But then again, you'll start seeing as you develop as a human being, you become more stable and you have a spouse and a family, um, or even getting towards the end of a career, a lot of times you kind of want to wind things down. You're looking more for that black stable part in this Mandelbrot set. Um, but this can be looked at as kind of the nudge, right? You need to nudge yourself a little left, a little right. It's not easy to just jump. You can't go from one position in the Mandelbrot and just jump all the way across the plane here uh, because we're moving through this Mandelbrot set. And so career planning is going to be very important. We'll talk about here on the next slide, but you're gonna to have to realize you can't just move quickly from point A to point B. So it's not that linear process we talked about. Um, you need to realize there's gonna be points in your career where you're kind of slowly going. You're just kind of there, you're doing the day-to-day, -day, 
right? You're trying to do stellar work. You're working on yourself, self-improvement and growth. Um, and it feels like you're just spinning your wheels, right? You're wasting time. Nothing's happening career-wise. Uh, just like this Mandelbrot set, right, as we're kind of staring at this, this image on the screen, uh, it's coming at you. And a lot of times it looks like, as we get to like this portion where it's purple, it looks like there's nothing there. And as we're waning and we're waning and we're waning, all of a sudden this green's coming up. It's like the right at the end, right? And that starts to expand. And when you get into that, there's going to be reds and purples and yellows and oranges. And all these opportunities are going to be on the horizon. And when you're floating through this career, you need to be on one hand, very patient and realize opportunities will come along throughout the career. But at the same time, you need to be building who you are, building relationships as we'll see here towards the end of the presentation uh, and doing this while you're in this kind of holding pattern and this waning here, right? You need to build a reputation, you need to build the skills and it takes a lot of time to be very, very good at this. And so the first step along this career development process is going to be setting your goal. So we talked about that hierarchy, right? And let's say I'm going to use that hierarchy and I think it's very linear and I want to be a CRO or I want to be, you know, I don't know, a hedge fund manager here. Um, that's great, but that doesn't add any value or meaning to your career. That's not really a goal per se, right? So you become some title. You get some title that means nothing, right? Uh, you can easily obtain these titles. So as an example here, let's say I want to be a CEO. It is extremely easy for me to run out tomorrow file for an LLC, for example, or C-Corp, um, and then say, okay, I'm the CEO of a new corporation, right? But what does that mean? And what we talked about here is in this hierarchy of businesses, right? You have global banks, you have all these different levels of banks and hedge funds um, and specializations, for example. It doesn't mean much to have some sort of title here. So you need to think about who you really are and kind of figure out what you want. And I like to look at these industry figures and kind of figure out their career. So I've read books on you know different individuals in the quant finance realm. They all are very, very unique and very different. And so some examples here on the screen is, you know, are you wanting to work in breakthrough research? Like for example, the Black-Scholes model when it first came out and even iterations after that and different methodologies have been kind of added to it. Um, again, thinking maybe your research passion is so strong that you don't want to be in the industry, you want to be in academia. Uh, maybe you realize that there's this really hard challenge between the two and you're going to try to kind of do both, right? And there are some famous quants like Peter Carr uh, and Emmanuel Derman who have done this. Um, again, it's very challenging to do, but maybe that's something you were trying to do here. Um, specialization we'll talk about a little bit later on too, but what area are you even specializing in, right? So many quants or people that want to be quants have this mentality that you're going to be a quant and know everything, right? You're like the super mega mind, right? Like the metaverse here with uh, with Facebook. Um, that's not how it works. There's always some sort of very, very specific specialty. If you want to be of any value in a quant career, you want to get paid a lot of money, they don't pay generalists a lot of money. They pay experts a lot of money. So you need to figure out where you're going to go here. And I have just some examples thrown out like cryptocurrency realms are coming up, uh, machine learning, time series, credit risk even inside of these areas. So say you say, I don't know, cryptocurrencies, are you gonna be working on like the blockchain technology and the transaction of this? Uh, are you gonna be working more on like, for example, derivative pricing on cryptocurrencies? Are you gonna be working on like data quality, data processing? How do you set up these data streams for this, right? These are all different skill sets and very different careers to think about. And then there are other types of people and goals, right? Managing a large team is a goal of mine, for example. Um, I want to be hands-on training individuals, making an educational impact in the industry, right? I want to make that impact last so that we have a better industry when I leave this. Um, again, these might be completely worthless and meaningless goals for any of you. Um, again, thinking about comfort of how much effort you want to put into a job, right? I, I can stand here and tell you, you know, I'm going to build teams. I want to impact the industry. I want to be a specialist in time series, which is my true passion in the quant finance realm. But again, there are people that are going to say, you know, I want to have a life. I want to go on vacation. Um, again, I rarely go on vacation. It's just because I'm always busy. I've got a million things going on. My life is chaotic and crazy. Now, again, you could. You could make different decisions. And these are things that you need to think about. And so work-life balance can be a portion of that goal here. You don't need to, I don't know, be that cookie cutter shape of what we think a quant is. Uh, again, Wall Street has changed significantly since all the movies came out, you know, Wolf on Wall Street and all that nonsense. Um, again, the industry has changed. We as humans change as well. As I mentioned before, don't be afraid to change your goals. 
as kind of things change for you, right? In that Mandelbrot set, things are coming, different opportunities arise. Um, really get to know who you are and what you want to do. But once you set up a goal, work as hard as you can towards it. And if things deviate, don't be afraid to take new opportunities, even if it might take you in a different direction. Just really think through why you're doing it and perhaps reset your goal of what you're kind of working towards. And this leads us to the hard skills. So I can't emphasize this enough here. Continued education is crucial for all quants across the realm here. Um, I talk about this a lot on my channel, educations and masters and PhDs and everything. A masters and a PhD is the very minimum requirement to work in the industry here, as we all know. Uh, but again, it's not even enough to even do the job. So I hope everyone realizes that, right? A master's and a PhD just gets your foot in the door. Uh, it just gets you the basic one-on-one skills to get hired as an analyst. And then people in the industry that are actually hiring you and working with you on teams have to invest a ton of time and effort to do this. Um, again, as I mentioned here as well as one of the bullets, industry-only information uh, is impossible to learn in universities and schools. It's why I think quant programs that bring in industry practitioners is a really good kind of advantage for students because you learn things that you just won't learn in a textbook. Um, for example, I work in credit risk right now. Looking at a lot of the things I've done in credit risk, I've read a lot of credit risk textbooks and there are large portions of what I've done in my job. I've learned from one of my colleagues who's basically an expert in this area for, I don't know, 20, 20 plus years. Um, he knows everything. There's a ton of information I've gained from him over the years, the way we do analytics. Even the type of analytics I've never seen any other bank do, for example, that only he's done, it's not gonna be taught to in academia. It's a constant learning process. And if you want to be on the cutting edge of quant finance, uh, you've gotta keep running 24 seven. So when you start your job, this is just the very, very beginning here. And then another key point I wanna drive home for building a successful quant career is learning everything from first principles. I know this is probably rocket science and I sound like some old timer talking to you about this, but most quant finance work, most of these problems don't have simple textbook solutions. And I know this sounds counterintuitive, especially if you work in somewhere like credit risk, as I've mentioned, which is well-defined, but often we run into new issues or new problems or new market dynamics which old models cannot handle or even current new methodologies cannot handle. And you have to start getting very, very hands-on, nitty-gritty, figuring out how to come up with some sort of solution to help solve the problem. And then when it doesn't fit perfectly, understanding those risks and assumptions behind it so that we can monitor them correctly. So risk management is crucial here. Uh, machine learning is one of these examples right now. I just see a lot of people running out, copying and pasting code left and right. Uh, I see a lot of examples taken from online websites that are copy and pasted. And unfortunately, 90 plus percent of this information is either too simplified down to use in quant finance because they don't fully understand the finance part of it, or it's just simply incorrect. So being understanding of the first principles and being able to build from the ground up all of your ideas and your challenges will make you much better across the board on every single topic here. So again, I've worked with PhDs, for example, specialized in time series. Um, I've challenged them. I've made them change the way they think about things. I've failed their models, for example, over the years. But again, it's because going back through this learning, that continued learning process here, getting out those you know first principles, trying to dig backwards as deep as you can into these topics, understanding the nuances, and then using those core principles or first principles here to really build up to that full spectrum here so you can apply uh, the methodologies correctly. So I can't emphasize that enough. It is something that is not seen very much in the industry. And if you have these sort of skills and employers figure this out, uh, you'll be in super high demand. So I see this a lot. There's one or two individuals here and there. Uh, people want to have them. They just have all the skills. They have the expertise. They've jumped from area to area and they continually be experts just because they understand uh, those first principles here in a lot of the academic, statistical, mathematical realms. And then finally, specialization pays far more than being a generalist. Um, a lot of people want to be like these big managers. We've talked about this hierarchy here. And they think it's really exciting. I'm going to be a manager. I'm not going to do the quant work after so much time. And this is true in many jobs. Uh, but if you want to make the really big dollars here, and you want to make those big leaps even to like senior roles, you need to build a reputation for being an expert in what you do. And if you work in quant finance, machine learning, data science, uh, you need to be a super, super expert to really 
add perspective to these firms and kind of grind them into the nitty gritty details, but then also be able to kind of build that reputation of realizing he can do it. We know him, we trust him. We might not fully understand it, um, but he's the guy basically to get promoted up the chain as well. So quant financing is changing drastically in the sense that, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, we saw a lot of business MBAs running these sort of teams. Uh, and then nowadays we're starting to see a huge shift that basically having a master's and PhD is almost a requirement now uh, to even be considered a management here. But again, specialization will make you a lot more money than being a generalist. Um, it's just how it works. And then finally here to wrap up more or less kind of this presentation of these topics here, soft skills is going to be the ch most challenging piece for quants. Um, again, hard skills are enough to get the job done, to make money. So if you're looking for a great work-life balance, you don't want to be that all-star, but you're really looking to um, show up, do the job fairly well and go home, just learn the hard skills, right? That's going to be it. Again, knowing the soft skills will help you get along with colleagues better, but knowing hard skills for quants, quants usually think is like the end-all be-all, uh, that's really just the very beginning one-on-one step to be an entry-level quant here. Uh, promotions, career development, building, managing teams, doing these things that require soft skills on top of your quant skills here. And again, managers have to make hard decisions on analytical work that the analysts have done. So you need to know those hard skills as a manager. Uh, but to get to that point, you also need to build these soft skills. Uh, and again, soft skills are extremely rare for quants, one's personality wise, myself included. Uh, many of us just aren't naturally inclined to be people, pe people, you know, focused. We don't love people. Uh, again, we all like to think we're great communicators. So I typically hear people say, oh, I'm an amazing communicator. Communication is one of my top skills. And then I work with these people and they're typically on the bottom end of that as being a skill. I don't know why, just seems kind of like an odd thing. But communication for quants is extremely challenging on multiple tiers and multiple levels. Uh, one being most quants, you're not native English speaker, speakers, right? So most quants are coming from abroad. Uh, they come to the US, for example, that's where we're at here. And then they get jobs here and they work here and they stay here. But the issue is they're not a native speaker. So there's always some sort of a accent, a barrier, uh, even like, for example, cultural like sayings, for example, can make it challenging because you don't understand the nuance behind it. You're, I have colleagues right there Googling these sorts of things. Um, and then on top of that, right, quants work super, super technical. And now if you're having to work with other teams, other managers, so as you climb corner of these you know, hierarchies we've been talking about here, you're like a CRO or even like a senior director, you're working a lot of times with business units or people that are using models. Uh, you have to be able to explain quant topics and technical things in very simple terms and explain to them the impacts or the negative impacts that we have and why without overcomplicating it. And I struggle a lot with this here. And that really leads us to talking about conflict resolution as well. So this is probably the number one soft skill we don't talk about that you need. Um, I've worked on model development, I've worked in implementation, I've worked in validation and internal audit across the spectrum here on the quant realm. But there's always conflicts between teams. So development and validation fight a lot because development makes models. Validation is a police officer basically that tells them, no, you can't do things. And then the worst piece here is you're going to have regulators on top of that telling both those teams what they can and can't do. And then you get dinged with all kinds of issues uh, because they don't approve of it. So conflict resolution is crucial. I've had meetings, sit downs where it's been like two people just standing there screaming at each other. This is not the way to do it, right? This is the worst scenario. This is where everything gets out of hand. These sort of things impact you negatively in a career and people really remember these. Uh, but being able to work with people, being able to compromise, and this is so hard on the quant side because realistically in the quant finance realm, everything is, most things are fairly black and white of this is the right way to do it, this is the wrong way to do it. Well, more specifically, there's one right way to do it and a million wrong ways to do it. But Sometimes there are other constraints and issues involved where either you can't solve it or there are political things involved where it's like it's not very important and the solution for it's going to take way too many resources to fix it. So coming up with creative solutions here, but having that conflict resolution, being able to really work with other people and come up with solutions without hurting everybody's feelings. And then when these things do blow up and explode and you do have massive arguments between teams and there's bad blood between them. Uh, coming to this conflict resolution of how do you make things better? I mean, we're all kind of working towards the same goal as teams, but how do you get to that point? So I think that's a really important skill um, 
that's hard to maintain. And again, you can see on here teamwork, teaching, time management and planning is huge. I see people that do amazing work, but they take way too long sometimes. Uh, being able to kind of work on these skills, these soft skills can make you much more valuable as a quant than simply the guy that just does the math and crunches the numbers. And finally here for networking on the bottom right, I've got a whole slide here to kind of wrap this up, but networking is one of those things where I feel like we all say we need to network more, we need to network better. Uh, networking is how you get promoted, it's how you build careers. It really is the foundation of building careers here. Um, but I wanted just to give a few examples and things here about networking and realistically networking is nothing more than building solid relationships with other people, which is again a huge soft skill. Uh, the main piece here right, is finding commonalities. You start on a new team, you meet someone on a different team. Um, I'm, I know we have a job to do, I know we show up and we're all working on our work, but often it's easier to start finding slow commonalities between things, slow hobbies, like you know, I don't know different hobbies that we enjoy or share, uh, different sorts of life situations. So for example, I don't know, I might be in my 30s, they're in their 30s, maybe I have kids that are just you know, a couple years old, they've got a few young kids. These sort of things are just things that are nice to like talk about as you're working on projects or you're like doing a quick introduction. So for example, a lot of times I come down to a meeting and I'm waiting for like six people to show up, one or two people roll in, uh, this is the great time to have that small talk of, you know, oh, how is your son's, you know, soccer game last week? I remember you mentioned that. And you kind of chat and build slow relationships. This will make your career easier because people will like you more. People realize you're actually there to kind of like, I don't know, be a human. Uh, and also it's nicer and more fun to work with people that care about you and you care about them. Again, lunches and coffees are another opportunity on how to actually do this. So coffees, lunches. Uh, are just ways to catch up with old friends, colleagues. If you leave firms, try to stay in contact with these different firms. It can always be helpful later on when you're looking for a job or they're looking for a job or even just getting advice here. So there's another circle down on the bottom. Um, often I look at things and think, you know, this is ridiculous. This is absurd. I can't believe, you know, I don't know, some firm I'm working for is doing it this way. And so I, you know, pull up my cell phone and I call up a few buddies of mine and say, you know, what are you guys doing on this, that, and the other? What are your standards for this? How did you guys put this together? Have you ever seen this sort of model being used? Have you done this sort of testing? And they'll give me advice and say, well, we're doing something similar and they'll explain it and explain why. Again, often communication coming from different people can portray that information better. So that communication skill might be better, especially if you have a good relationship with them. They might tell you more things. Uh, on the advice part as well, career advice is something that's just really hard to find. So I'll be honest with you guys, it's why I run a YouTube channel. Um, finding honest, true advice is crucial. When I look at changing jobs or I look at you know hiring on our team, we have someone that's kind of coming in and I'm kind of sketchy. Uh, I will often call other colleagues I've had in the past I've worked with um, or even people in different departments and say, hey, you know, I've got this tough situation. Uh, I'm doing X, Y, and Z. I don't know what to do in this position. What would you do? Again, I don't have to do what they say, but it's nice to get feedback and again, have those relationships, you know where they're kind of coming from. And then for students, right, you're new, you're fresh, how do you break into the industry here? Informational interviews is crucial. Um, as I mentioned, right, setting those goals, what are you wanting to do? A lot of people don't think about the very specific areas in quant finance where you end up in, I don't know, financial engineering of actually building financial products. For example, maybe you're specializing in mortgage-backed securities. Um, you could be someone on like the sales and trading side, which I don't view as a quant job. But again, understanding what those roles entail, understanding the skills they have, you're not gonna know this. YouTube, Reddit, all these things are horrible sources of advice, which I say that as a YouTuber. Uh, but most channels just don't tell you the honest truth. And a lot of them just don't work in the industry. So they're giving you advice, they're reading off these forms from undergrads who are speculating through stories that have kind of been pushed through this for 20, 30 years and they're outdated and don't work even if they are truthful. So informational interviews is a great way to network, meet people, learn a lot about the industry and take an interest, personal interest in somebody else. And then I've had inter informational interviews with people I have just followed over the years and they gave me advice, I've taken their advice, I followed up with them you know, a year or two years later. So I'm not emailing them weekly or anything, but it comes back to like, you know, giving them an update. Hey, I got this job finally. You know, I already went and got the master's. I finished my undergrad when I talked to you last. It's been, I don't know, two years, three years. Um, these sort of things are good. It's a good way to learn and help set your own goals as we've talked about career-wise, the change to shift and everything. Uh, but it's a great way to kind of get your foot in the door and meet people. And when people are looking for jobs, 
If your name happens to come up because they're thinking about you in the back of their mind, uh, maybe you had a phone call last week, it's an easy way to kind of get in the industry and start your career, that whole quant career building. And yeah, a course on here as well, helping others is crucial. Um, I can't emphasize that enough, right? Helping, helping, helping. I help a lot of people. I don't expect anything in return, right? You just need to be a good, helpful person. And often it just plays pays back in spades, right? It's just helping people. A lot of times you have some weird thing you need help with, you need advice from. Uh, it could be personal advice, career advice, these sorts of things. But it's always good to have someone there kind of on your team here. So giving advice, giving help, uh, getting advice is also crucial. So those are kind of the takeaways I have here on building that quant career. Um, quant focus here, quant skills is hard. Technical skills are extremely challenging to obtain, as many of you know. Uh, being a specialist is important. But also don't forget about all these soft skills and kind of building out these careers because realistically, it is far easier to hire someone you know because I already know all your strengths. I already know all your weaknesses. I already know, you know all kinds of personal stuff about you, which makes it much easier for me to hire you because I know what you can and can't do and I know what the problems are that you know the firm that you're working at is. I know all their issues as well. So trying to find that perfect fit is always challenging even when you're looking at resumes online. So it's much easier to hire someone through this networking process here. But these are crucial points here for building a career, a quant career. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Uh, this is kind of, you know, hard to do in a quant career. I've been trying to document my career as I've gone through YouTube so you guys get a better perspective of the weird decisions I'm making. I try to speak a little more openly about these topics as well, so I'm not sugarcoating it and making it seem like, you know, I'm some high-rolling Wall Street exec uh, that just gets everything handed to them. So, anyways, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And as always, until next time.